I even brought some mat exercise as we went waiting for Metallica. Uh, <laughs> a Metallica concert. Definitely the coolest kids at the Metallica concert. Uh, exactly. <laughs> some people do drugs, some people dance, you're out here like doing advanced calculus, you know. So, I know that you did all of your math education up to your master's degree in Quebec, yep. and then you went to MIT, right, for yep. your PhD. What kind of differences have you found, if any, or similarities between doing math in French and doing math in a primarily English-speaking space? I didn't find a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, one must say that like the, the, the academic environment mm -hmm. in Quebec is similar to the academic environment in the U.S. There are, of course, linguistic differences, but uh, I would say that I've learned the math earlier, if you want, than, than regular English conversation. So I could talk, I could listen to the <laughs> courses and, 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 and be intelligent in mathematics, and in the common room when we were having lunch, discussing about politics, that was extremely hard in English with all the noise around. When you lecture hall, it's sort of you alone mm -hmm. with, with the teacher who's speaking basically to you and others, but there's only one mm -hmm. source of sound. Fun fact, mm -hmm. the word positive in French and in English doesn't mean the same thing. I can imagine that would throw you off in math. <laughs> That's okay, you learn and grow from it, but in English you mm -hmm. start positive above zero. Mm -hmm. So any real number greater than zero is a positive mm -hmm. real number. In French, positive real number is any real number zero and above. Huh. I was hoping we could talk a little bit specifically about the Bridges Lecture Series. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that came to be and why you're so proud of it? Went to the Dean and says, look, I'd like to apply for this grant and maybe we put a couple of lectures together where we have a mathematician and a non-mathematician that build together one lecture. Our most popular Bridges Lecture, the one that was like standing room only, is when we had a historian. Mm -hmm. and a mathematician come to talk about uh, the coding mm -hmm. and about the, specifically the Enigma machine. And at the same time, and, and so forth. Correct. Uh, we had one on stage, well, that's a functioning cool. one. Did you get to play with it at all? I did. I was the <laughs> one that uh, I was obeying to the lecturers <laughs> and doing what they're asking me uh -huh. to do. Did you Just find that the people who came to this were people who might not necessarily be interested in a regular mathematics lecture? Oh, I heard that a lot of time. I remember many people that came to me afterwards and said, you know, I, I would not have come to a math lecture, but here it's okay because if I don't <laughs> understand, there's other things to entertain me. And they, like, they felt this was exciting. It's like, like cheating. It's that. like cheating a little bit. Like they feel <laughs> like they're part of this intellectual environment. They learn it, mm -hmm. but it's safe. And so we created this safe space for people to hear about mathematics. Often we think about our various fields as siloed, right? Like each of us is doing our own thing in academia and we don't necessarily build the relationships or publicly acknowledge the connections between our fields. But it seems like this was kind of a representation of a philosophy that I think you have that we do better work if we think outside of that box or think outside of that narrow field and work with people either within mathematics or within other fields who might have interesting resonances. All of these are fake boundaries. They're, <laughs> they're really to organize the work mm -hmm. of people um, because we do need some organization. We couldn't be a university with no departments. It would be chaotic. Right. And so we need to sort of organize. But these walls, we have to remember, are totally fake. They're not real walls. If we think about them as lines we're not allowed to cross in our research, then it's going to limit what we're willing to explore. Correct. My research gauge theory is a good example where, where really it's coming from mathematical physics on one hand and differential geometry and algebraic geometry. Sometimes what I do is interesting to physicists and sometimes what they do is interesting to me and sometimes we go uh, each other way. But it has been this incredibly fruitful collaboration between the disciplines. Let's talk about some geometry, yes. some very old geometry. So these are the five platonic solids. Mm -hmm. They are the five shapes. You need to have the same number around each face. You can do this thing in dimension four. Okay, polyhedron dimension three, polytope dimension four. Okay. okay. Imagine for a second, where's my chalk? Let's me project the cube okay. right now on the blackboard. Okay. Imagine I have, I'm holding this cube, right? You see, fourth it? Dimensional you see it? No, this three dimensional. Okay, three dimensional cube. I'm projecting it, and when I project it in one way, it looks like this. Right. Right. I could let me push it down a little bit. I I turn it around and I project it. Maybe now it looks like this. Right. All right. So I do the same thing in dimension four, and now project it. I could project it to dimension two. 
Mm -hmm. But I could project it to dimension three. So imagine a light that casts a shadow. Okay. And this is the shadow of an object called the 600 cell. It's built of 600 tetrahedron. And that's a four dimensional object. That's a four dimensional okay. object. This one here, many of you are familiar with it. Can you recognize it? Is it a cube, but in four dimensions? Yes, and do you know another name for it? Is it a tesseract? It is a tesseract. So <laughs> I know that tesseract... because of A Wrinkle in Time by Madeleine Langle. Well, there's many uh, uh, movies. And, Thor has yeah, the tesseract in it. Exactly. Yeah. So many part of popular culture. Is this one going to allow me to control the universe? Uh, uh, <sighs> unlikely. But this is only one possible projection. There's multiple projections. If we find the right can... one, maybe that's the one for world domination. Perhaps. In 2019, mm -hmm. we looked at an incredible object called the Omnitruncated Dodecaplex. So the Omnitruncated 120 cell. The 120 cell is an object which is dual to yeah. this one, which is built of 120 dodecahedron. Right, which is the 12 sided. Correct. Composed of 12 pentagons. Mm -hmm. And now you take 120 of those and you get the Dodecaplex, and now you take that object, or this one, whichever you want, and you truncate everything. Mm -hmm. That is, you take your knife, and now you cut all the vertices, and you cut along the edges, and you cut along the faces, and you cut along the cells, and then you obtain something extremely more complicated. The real question I have is where you got a fourth dimensional knife. As a mathematician, I don't care that much about a physical <laughs> object. I do it with the my knife. sharp mind. That's where the knife is. And this is four different projections of the 120 cell. This one is through a vertex. This one is through an edge. Uh -huh. This one through a face. And I need to introduce a new word. Uh -huh. This one is through a cell. So the one we have in M3 uh -huh. is exactly this projection here, projected through a cell. It's neat because as I turn it, I can kind of see the way, like from this angle, it looks completely almost arbitrary. But then if I turn it here, I can look through at you. Uh, it reminds me of a kaleidoscope. That's a very good uh, analogy. Uh, and in fact, you can build this by building a kaleidoscope in dimension four. Least favorite depiction of mathematics in pop culture. It's not a particular movie, but I, I'm always a little bit upset when they give you the impression that mathematicians can find answers to very complicated problems on the spot. People suddenly decrypting very complex things just because they're very intelligent. That's not real. If you were a member of a team planning a heist, like in Ocean's Eleven or something like yes. that. I love these sort of movies yeah. where intelligence is sort of running the show. Then you probably thought of this question, which member of the heist team would you be and why? Oh, but I'm a very honest person. I don't want to be in any <laughs> heist. I think this is very important. Everyone knows this. Um, don't ask about my favorite color because uh, I sometimes use it with banks and things like this. And then <laughs> I would be stuck, right? What do I do? If you know, then everyone you just knows. just give away your passwords here. Exactly. If only you've been in cryptography instead of geometry. <laughs>